Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Mesprink. I'm a statistician um, at Navaris Pharmaceuticals. And today I'm coming to you to talk a little bit about the, the criminal trial design experience during COVID-19, in particular, designing trials for the treatment of the coronavirus. The year 2020 has been an epic year. Remember for generations with the emergence of a global pandemic caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It has brought great opportunities throughout the scientific community and the pharmaceutical industry to find effective treatments to help in the recovery of patients who are infected with the virus and develop vaccines to help prevent the global population from becoming infected, potentially having a fatal or long-term debilitating outcome through the virus in the future. Anytime one enters a drug development in a new disease area, there will be challenges and obstacles that will create obstacles for us as statisticians in design, execution, and analysis of clinical trials to demonstrate that treatments are safe and effective to treat the new condition. These challenges became overly accentuated during the pandemic when everyone is in competition to design the best trial to answer clinical hypotheses in the shortest time possible, especially when the pandemic started and many of us did not have a good idea how best to design such trials to answer these questions with a high degree of confidence. Throughout the course of the pandemic, not only has the patient population continued to change, but also the standard of care has continued to making the determination of the target population, best endpoint to determine if the treatment is effective, and then require patients to demonstrate effectiveness an incredibly challenging task. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about, about some, of the, some of these issues. First, let's talk about how do we determine the right population. When the pandemic started, and many hospitals in the country were overflowing with patients, the focus was on studying those patients hospitalized due to their COVID-19. This may seem very straightforward to anyone who has not been actively involved in the development of treatments for COVID-19, but it's actually been a major source of the problem in finding the best treatment for patients hospitalized due to the illness. As part of the patient screening process for clinical study eligibility, many people use a seven or eight point ordinal scale Within the ordinal scale, hospitalized patients were in one of four categories usually. Either they were hospitalized, not requiring supplemental oxygen, but requiring some ongoing medical care, hospitalized requiring supplemental oxygen, hospitalized requiring non-invasive ventilation or high flow oxygen devices, or hospitalized receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or barrier known as ECMO. As you may expect, these categories represent a very heterogeneous patient population with highly variable degrees of baseline risk, mortality, and morbidity. Thus, effectiveness with a single therapy agent has not been demonstrated across all levels of disease severity, which brings us to question the robustness of the efficacy shown by these treatments. We have two, two treatments have shown some degree of success from Desivir and dexamethasone. And remember, Desivir trial primary outcome was time to recovery during the 28 days after enrollment, where recovery is defined as not being hospitalized with no limitations, not being hospitalized with some limitations, or home oxygen requirement both, hospitalized, not requiring supplemental oxygen, and no longer requiring ongoing medical care. In the recovery study, which is done in the UK, clinical studies evaluated dexamethasone across many treatments in the platform trial, and the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality within 28 days after randomization. And rate ratio was used as the measure of determining effectiveness in both trials. In the, in the remdesivir trial, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, the recovery rate showed overall, effect, overall differentiation from placebo or standard care over the course of the time period. But what was interesting is that the recovery rate very, very differently across the, the different levels of baseline severity, where the greatest sort of improvement was seen in those less severe, um, either only receiving supplemental oxygen or, or some level of slightly increased level of supplemental oxygen uh, of high flow. Once you get to the more severe patients requir requiring um, mechanical ventilation, um, remdesivir actually showed a lower recovery rate than the standard of care with a rate ratio of 0.95. And this was somewhat interesting. These patterns were also consistent with the 20 day mortality rate comparison across baseline disease areas, where those with a baseline risk of value six or seven were more likely to die from remdesivir than with the standard of care. In a recovery trial, 
which was done in about, which looked at Dexanax zone and approximately 6,000 subjects from around 4,300 on, on standard of care or placebo and around 2,100 on Dexanax it was shown that the rate ratio for mortality over 20 days was 0.83, which means it was a 17% reduction in deaths relative to standard care. Um, this result too was, was sort of driven by certain subgroups. Um, for example, for those with patients not receiving any oxygen, rate ratio for 20 day mortality was actually 1.19, which implies that dexamethasone actually increased risk mortality in that group. The, the result here was primarily driven by those receiving invasive mechanical ventilation where the rate ratio was 0.64. What this tells us is that the virus, virus behaves very differently in different patient populations. With from death severe, the recovery is best in those who are less severe and still hospitalized because potentially the inflammation in the tissue and the organs that was observed with many COVID-19 patients has not occurred yet. One of those patients, an antiviral like from death severe, has a reasonable chance of being effective in treating such patients. In contrast to this, a potent steroid like dexamethasone works best in the most severe patients who have undergone a reaction known as cytokine release syndrome, which if not treated can often lead to multi-organ failure prior to death, thus by reducing inflammation, even those in the most morbid state prior to death have a chance of recovery. It is clear monotherapy will not likely be most effective in treating such patients, which is why many of the clinical studies ongoing are looking at combination therapies often combining different classes of drugs with the antiviral treatment remdesivir to treat all the dimensions of the disease. This leads one to ask a different question with respect to the SMM framework, what is the treatment of interest? In other words, what is the treatment of interest and how can you define intercurrent events? In October 2020, there are no approved treatments for the SARS-CoV-19 virus by FDA. Note, um, recently, um, remdesivir was approved by the FDA um, as, as, as a therapy for hospitalized patients down, down to the age of 12. At the start of the pandemic, when designed clinical trials to treat the COVID-19 virus, there was much discussion on what was standard of care. The answer provided, often by physicians who were involved in the treatment of COVID-19 patients, was anything that will provide benefits to the patients and help in the recovery will be tried. Under these considerations, any concomitant treatments or procedures using treating the patient to help them recover from COVID-19 as part of standard care. This implies that it's, it's theoretically possible the patient could receive two, three, or more additional treatments if they are accessible that are currently being evaluated possible COVID-19 treatments as part of standard care group in the clinical trial in which they are participating. Some clinical trials were designed to estimate the treatment effect with minimal bias by excluding antiviral treatments as part of standard care when antiviral treatment was the experimental treatment being evaluated in the clinical trial. This paradigm changed when the FDA issued an emergency use authorization for remdesivir, making it a standard care for hospitalized patients where it is available. The challenge that existed is that remdesivir has become a standard care in hospitalized patients where it is available. However, it's not always in all regions of the world where COVID-19 clinical trials are being conducted in hospitalized patients. This has the potential to introduce substantial differences in response rate within the standard care group across geographic regions and introduce a level of bias because not all patients have access to the same treatments. Given that there, are, there were no approved treatments when most of the trials have been done this year, even when new concomitant treatments are added, such changes in standard care for the patient will be handled as treatment policy, if such changes will be considered as intercurrent events, and thus includes part of the treatment of interest definition. Efforts continue towards finding the best treatments, but for different criteria that will affect with the, 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 virus, the sars cov virus. Increased efforts will focus on finding the best combination of treatments to, to eradicate the virus and its symptoms and the complication that may ensue as the very virus worsens or if patients try to return to normalcy when a virus is no longer detectable when tested. Improved treatment options for patients confirmed in the clinical trial setting are hopefully on the near-term horizon. With this, the standard of care as part of treatment of interest will continue to evolve and increase the importance of the use of adaptive platform trials to allow for open entry of new potential treatments as well as adaptations the control arms, and the exiting of ineffective treatments. Let's talk a little bit about what is the best endpoint for demonstrating effectiveness of COVID-19. In most of the randomized controlled trials for COVID-19, the endpoints evaluating these trials are derived in some way from the WHO ordinal scale that has been developed for use as COVID-19 and COVID-19 clinical trials. The problem that exists is almost every implementation of the ordinal scale deviates from the nine-point scale that was developed for use. 
This creates a different problem in an area that is perfectly set up for ongoing analysis to be performed. The question becomes, are the endpoints across different clinical trials actually comparable? A detailed summary of the endpoints derived from the WHO disease severity ordinal scale is provided in O'Kelly and Lee in, uh, in a, a recent paper, along with the operating characteristics of those endpoints in different settings. All the endpoints derived from the WHO ordinal scale have strengths and weaknesses. Timely recovery has been used the most frequently as a primary endpoint across clinical trials followed by 28-day mortality. However, as mortality rates decrease over time with those who've been infected, the size of the trial required to demonstrate a statistically significant reduction in mortality becomes unachievable. Note, even in recovery, over 6,000 patients were required to demonstrate a mortality benefit for dexamethasone when the 20-day death rates were greater than 20% in both experimental treatment and control arms. Interim death rear results reported by Beagle and all in their control medicine, the original insight based on improvement in the ordinal scale was adapted to, to time recovery after an early blind interim analysis, which also noted that the sample size needed to be increased from a sample size of around 450 patients to a sample size of over 1,000 patients. The challenge faced by all these endpoints is that they do not capture the patient journey to their clinical outcome, recovery free of virus or death. Often it's plausible for a patient to experience both improvement and worsening the disease over time. In a recent paper uh, pre-printed by, by Lindenall, proposed averaging of these states in which a patient resides with time taking an area under the curve approach to evaluate, evaluate differences in the time spent in different disease states across patients has been recommended. This would appear to be far more sensitive to change and can select meaningful differences potentially with fewer patients and require further examination in many of the platform trials and massive protocols that are currently being executed to evaluate a wide range of different types of COVID-19 treatments. As the standard of care improves, the demand for doing more outpatient trials will continue to increase. In this patient population, the current FDA recommendation of registration or to demonstrate fast recovery from the symptoms of COVID-19. However, as the number of patients being hospitalized remains lower than the start of the pandemic, it's more important for those treated in the patient setting to prevent hospitalization for their recovery. This is a question that still has to be addressed. Evaluation through medical analysis across studies will be necessary to evaluate what are the best endpoints in this patient population. So since the start of 2020, development treatments of COVID-19 has traveled a long journey and faced many obstacles along the way. Many companies have tried to repurpose medicines that are being used to treat other conditions with the hope that either they can eradicate the virus or reduce the cytokine activity experiences by the more severely ill patients. The results of these efforts have been mixed with failures outnumbering the successes. There are many reasons why these clinical trials have been less than successful. The cause of failure are not necessarily always the fault of the sponsors. This may be because it has been almost impossible to keep up with the dynamic environment or where the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been mutated over time. In addition, the patients infected with the virus have also evolved in their demographic and baseline characteristics. As have the medical knowledge, the pathophysiology and ability to treat the patients and their symptoms, which has increased the probability of eventual recovery. The race to find highly effective treatments is clearly a marathon and not spread to the finish line. All who are involved in the effort share the passion to do all that is possible to find the best design, patient population, and endpoint to test the treatment of interest to demonstrate that an effective and safe treatment can be developed and may be available to save lives around the world as vaccine development continues in parallel. As we continue to learn from the data gathered across clinical trials, meta-analysis, and network meta-analysis will be conducted in earnest to determine which treatments are the most appropriate to treat the millions who will become infected by the virus over the coming months. I thank you for listening to me.